Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Forgery. So for this one, we are talking about a scandal that happened that was entirely built on a lie, but this scandal is one that affected national politics at the time. So a man named Alfred Dreyfus was a Jewish officer in the French army in the late 19th century, but he was accused of treason as it was said he was selling military secrets to Germany. His trial was huge in the media and he ended up being sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island and hateful and prejudiced groups used him as an example of a quote unpatriotic Jewish person. After this sentence however, people began to suspect that the letters that incriminated him were actually forged and that the real culprit was a major named Charles Esterhazy. It is said that the French authorities tried to suppress these accusations but a novelist named Emily Zola continued to accuse the army of a cover up. People were torn at this point. Some people swore that Alfred was still to blame while others were convinced he was innocent. In the end, the fight became more about the principle rather than whether or not Alfred was really innocent or not. There were 12 years of controversy surrounding this case until Major Hubert Joseph Henry ended up admitting to forging the key documents before taking his own life. The case was finally reopened and while Alfred was found guilty again, he soon received a pardon from the president. A few years after this, a civilian court of appeals found Alfred innocent as well and he went on to have quite an army career and he even fought with honor in the First World War. This was a scandal that really did change French politics forever. In our number 9 spot today we have The Project. It is said that throughout the last few presidential administrations that the American people were lied to about the progress of the Afghan war, the longest conflict in American history. According to the Washington Post, over 400 different officials, generals, aid workers, diplomats, and Afghan government personnel that were involved in the war deliberately lied to the American people about what was happening in the war and that they hid evidence that the war had become unwinnable. It is said that the documents that revealed this information were generated by a federal project that aimed to examine all of the causes for the failures of this conflict. The project provided 2,000 pages of notes from interviews with all of those involved. In our number 8 spot today we have federal spending. So according to a Harvard Business Review article that was written by Peter Vanderwicken titled Why the News is Not the Truth, he claimed that the media and the government are quote, entwined in a vicious circle of mutual manipulation, myth making, and self interest. He uses the effort in the 1980s to eliminate the federal deficit as an example, specifically focusing on the Graham Rudman Hollings Amendment. If unfamiliar, this was basically the first binding spending constraints placed on the federal budget. Peter states that for many years there were several media outlets that ran hundreds of stories on the debates over this budget and quote the views of all sorts of experts on the urgent need for deficit reduction and the eventual enactment of the legislation. He continues on to say that quote anyone who read a newspaper or watched television news received the message that Congress and the Reagan administration were heroically and painfully struggling to contain government spending and reduce the deficit. This is of course a list of government lies, so where does that come in? Well apparently behind the guise of this diligent work, congressional committees and federal officials were actually increasing spending and adding new programs into the annual spending. Basically the entire article describes how quote, journalists conspired with politicians to create an image of a government fighting to end the deficit crisis, but they ignored the routine procedures that increased the deficit. In our number 7 spot today we have listening in. Back in 2013, when Edward Snowden released a bunch of classified information and documents, it was leaked that the United States was spying on Germany, France, and Spain. It is said that the government tapped 35 phones, and not just anyone's phone, the phones of world leaders. Of course, when some of them found that out after the leak, they were quick to point out how spying between friends is just not cool. It was however also released that world leaders were not the only ones being spied on as it was found that the NSA was monitoring phone calls in Spain and these calls were between just anyone. And it wasn't just some here or there, it was said that about 60 million calls were monitored in just one month. That's so many! 
So yeah, everyone was definitely a little annoyed to say the least when this information was leaked. In our number six spot today, we have the Verizon scandal. Again, back in 2013, The Guardian reported that the Obama administration had allowed the NSA to collect different caller information from Verizon. This is again something that was said to have leaked as part of the information that was released by Edward Snowden, and the information was able to be collected through what was called a quote, business records provision of the Patriot Act that was established under the presidency of George W. Bush. It allowed the government to order Verizon to hand over caller information every day. This information included things like the time, location, and the duration of the call. The information began being collected under the Bush administration in 2001, and they were collected from AT&T, Verizon, and Bell South. Of course, once these documents were leaked and this information became public knowledge, U.S. officials began trying to reassure the public that this surveillance was some somehow necessary and was actually a program vital to national security, but many people rightfully felt like the spying was an unnecessary invasion of their privacy. This one is tricky because there's definitely a fine line when it comes to things like this. In our number five spot today, we have the embassy missions. This is a secret that was hidden from not only the American people, but also the people that were being spied on and listened to, but it wasn't revealed until 2007 when a document was leaked. This document is one that named 38 different embassies and missions that were so-called, quote, targets of US surveillance. The document didn't quite make it clear whether or not these targets were being looked into by only the NSA or if the CIA and FBI were also involved. The document described certain things like bugging fax machines with devices that allowed them to listen in on conversations, and the document also listed the names of different programs that are used within the embassies. The document showed that the embassies targeted weren't just those of countries who seemed to be enemies with the United States, and instead included places like India and Mexico, Greece and Turkey. It appears as if the goal was to gain insider information into the diplomatic relations between the targets in the United States. The EU embassy in Washington DC was one of the targets on this document, and this leak had the potential to have jeopardized one of the largest attempted free trade agreements in the world, because shortly after this all came out, negotiations were set to begin between the EU and the United States. The French president at the time made his anger about the situation very public and stated that all future negotiations will only be made under the agreement that the United States cease all unauthorized surveillance of any EU buildings or personnel. In our number four spot today, we have the Pentagon Papers. Former President Lyndon B. Johnson is said to have kept many secrets and lies about the Vietnam War hidden away until a military analyst leaked the records and exposed the truth back in 1971, right in the New York Times. The Pentagon Papers were a very secret Department of Defense study and the papers, when leaked, told everyone about the extent of America's political and military involvement in the Vietnam War. President Johnson certainly was not the only president named in these papers, as other names included Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy, who is said to have been extremely misleading about the United States' direct involvement in the war. The release of these papers really only fueled people in their protests against the war, and it was also one of the moments where the public lost a lot of trust that they once had in the government. In our number three spot today, we have Watergate. This is perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel Complex in Washington, D.C. As the year went on and the 1972 presidential election came closer, there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington Washington Post reporters that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported to the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There was a series of Senate hearings, and the Senate even went on to create a special investigation committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, and they had 
had witnesses testifying that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in, and that there was a voice-activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks, and in the end, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators, which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on, but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent impeachment, Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign, making him the only president to do so. His successor, Gerald Ford, ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution, but there were 69 other people indicted, with 48 of them later being convicted. This is probably the biggest political scandal in US history, and it revealed corruption beyond what Americans at the time could believe, especially after the Pentagon Papers. It truly changed the way people would look at government leaders forever. In our number two spot today, we have The Call. So this is a lie, or maybe deception is a better way to put it, but either way, it came to light when the telephone calls of former President Lyndon B. Johnson were revealed. Basically, a phone call somehow came to light that showed that the then presidential candidate, Richard Nixon, might have negotiated behind the president's back with South Vietnam. Allegedly, South Vietnam ended up pulling out of the Paris peace talks after being told that Nixon would get them a better deal once elected. People believe that he did this because he was concerned that an earlier ending to the war would end up derailing his election campaign, since the war was one of the most pressing campaign issues. In the end, Nixon did end up winning the election by less than 1% of the popular vote. For many years, this was speculated and rumors were swirling, but once the phone calls were released, it seemed to confirm what many believed for years. In our number one spot today, we have the big lie. Okay, we've talked a lot about the United States government today, but of course, that's not the only government that has lied to its people. And some of these definitely aren't the most harmful lies told by the government, but this is one that would certainly make that list. Prior to the 1930s, and really the start of World War II, prejudice against Jewish people was not a new thing. Although the people who we'll call Yahtzees in order to navigate these online guidelines began to perpetrate these age-old lies. With the rise in this hateful group came a national policy that was called, quote, the final solution, which is a policy that we all know now was meant to eliminate Jewish people. To accomplish this terrible task, the leader of this group, who we'll call Madolf Mittler, and his minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, launched a huge campaign that was meant to spread lies to the German people that would make them believe that Jewish people were their enemies. Some of the lies spread were even ones that dated all of some of the lies spread were even ones that dated all the way back to the Middle Ages, and some of them had more modern context but were equally as outrageous, such as the lie spread that suggested Jewish people were to blame for Germany losing World War I. By using Jewish people as scapegoats, they were able to create what is now referred to as the big lie. Starting us off at number 10 is Jane Toppin. Likely responsible for nearly 31 deaths, Jane, or Jolly Jane as she's often referred to, had a very unique motive to have more people helpless people than any other man or woman who ever lived. She came from a very abusive household, and after her mother's death, she and her sisters were given up to an orphanage. Now, not much is known about what went on during her time there, but just two years after she was admitted, she was hired as a servant for a family in Massachusetts. As an adult, Jane began studying nursing and was well liked as a hospital, but soon she began fixating on elderly and sick patients and began using them as test subjects for morphine and atrophy injections as she was interested in what it would do to their nervous systems. Upon her arrest, she was coined an angel of death, as she reported that she would poison her victims before laying down with them and fondling their helpless bodies until they passed. She said she derived pleasure from the patients on the brink of death and felt as though she could see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. Although at first her victims were elderly and sick, she began to poison more recklessly friends, family, and even her housekeeper. During trial, she insisted on being declared sane as she wanted the possibility of release, but the jury ruled her unfit for trial and had her committed to an institution where she remained until her death in 1938. Next up at number 9 is Rodney Alcala. During the late 70s, Rodney came into the public eye after appearing on the TV show The Dating Game, but what America didn't know was that he was actually a cold-blooded 
It's kind of wild that he managed to get on the show in the first place because he had already had a pretty hefty criminal history, having already been one of America's most wanted fugitives for several kidnappings of young girls, as well as a few suspected kids. But I guess they just didn't really do much of a background check for the contestants. At the time, fellow contestants thought he was very strange and creepy, but still he won the competition and a date with the bachelorette. However, she too felt something was wrong with him, so refused to go on a date. And authorities believe that was what might have thrown Rodney over the edge. He began kidnapping at a much higher rate, inviting unsuspecting girls and boys to his house to model for him. Once he got them to his house, he would take them into his photo room and force them to take explicit photos before taking advantage of them and ending their lives. Finally, authorities caught on to him and upon his 1979 arrest, they uncovered more than a thousand photographs linking him to a suspected 130 victims. Officially, he was convicted for eight and sentenced to death, but died of natural causes before the day came. Next up at number eight is Albert Fish. Also known as the Brooklyn Vampire, Albert Fish was a terrifying responsible for the death of three people in the mid-1920s, although according to him, it was well over a hundred. Fish grew up in an unstable home. Both his parents suffered from mental illness, and after his father died, he was sent to live in an orphanage. While there, he was abused by the other orphans, but he started to develop a rather confusing feeling towards the pain. He began to enjoy it. As Fish got older, he started seeking darker and more twisted things to feel alive, and soon that led to the kidnapping Napping, taking advantage of, and subsequent devouring of m Thankfully, the monster was caught in 1935, and shockingly, he wasted no time denying his atrocities. In fact, he almost seemed proud of them. I can't, and frankly, won't go into detail about what he did, but it is some of the most disgusting stuff I've ever read about. Eventually, Fish was sentenced to death and died by electric chair in 1936, and after his death, his lawyer refused to release his statement, saying, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. Next up at number seven is Robert Hansen. Known in the media as the Butcher Baker, Hansen was an extremely sick who quite literally viewed his victims as prey. In his adolescence, Robert was an awkward and shy boy who had absolutely no luck with girls. These early rejections festered into a deep hatred for women for which he would later seek revenge. As he got older, he began finding solace in archery and hunting and would routinely spend his time perfecting his craft alone in the woods. Then in the early 1960s, he began seeking revenge, at first by committing arson on his high school property, but then soon turning to seek revenge on women specifically. By 1971, he was kidnapping and taking advantage of women, but not yet. He was charged and sentenced to five years for his crimes, but after just six months was released on a work program. After his release was where it got really scary. He began kidnapping women and escorts, taking them back to his apartment where he would do awful things to their bodies before flying them out to secluded areas in the wilderness and telling them that he was going to hunt them down and them. Tragically, an estimated 21 women lost their lives to this monster, but thankfully he was convicted and sentenced to 461 years in prison without possibility of parole. Coming in at number 6, we have Henry Lee Lucas. Active between 1960 to 1983, Lucas was a convicted responsible for the death of at least three people, one of which was his own mother. Lucas and his mother had a very relationship. In his early years, she worked as an escort and would force Lucas to watch her in the act, often forcing him to cross as well so she could to her clients. Then in 1949, Lucas's father passed away and shortly after, he dropped out of school and ran away from home. After a stint in prison for burglary, he was released in 1959 before reconnecting with his family. Soon, he was visited by his mother and told her of his new fiance he had met through pen pal while being locked up. But his mother didn't approve and wanted him to move back in with her and take care of her. Then one night in a heated argument, she struck him with a broom before he he stabbed her through the neck and fled the scene. Lucas was promptly convicted for the crime and sentenced to 40 years, but after only 10 years away, they released him due to overcrowding. From there, it only got worse. Lucas was a man on the run and started kidnapping and taking advantage of 
at a disgusting rate, one of which was his own daughter, as well as the daughter of fellow convicted felon Otis Toole. Eventually, he was caught for his crimes and sentenced to death after confessing to six hundred killings. And although his claim of 600 was never taken to heart, it is likely that the number was very high and no one really knows just how many people he harmed for sure. Coming in at number 5, Adolfo Constanzo. Active during the late 1980s, Adolfo was a brutal and cult leader responsible for the death of a suspected 26 people. Early on, Adolfo was introduced to voodoo, occult, and palo mayombe, and began to develop an interest in animal sacrifice for ritualistic purposes. Once an adult, he moved to Mexico City where he started a business performing his sacrifices for clients looking to receive good luck. Many of his clients were involved in high-ranking cartels, and he even began to make friends with corrupt officers. Soon enough, the sacrifice of animals wasn't satiating his needs, and so he began to exhume bodies, thinking that their bones held more power than that of an animal. But soon enough, he and his cult decided that committing human sacrifices would provide even more power, and so the brutality began. The cult 20 people mutilating their bodies for power, but soon even that wasn't enough. Constanzo decided he needed an incredible brain to reach his peak. He ordered his henchmen to abduct a pre-med student named Mark Kilroy, who they brought back, sacrificing him and taking out his brain carefully before adding it to their pile of human sacrifices. Eventually, police got word of the cult and set out to raid the ranch, but Adolfo fled with four of his followers to a nearby apartment. Police tracked him down and Adolfo determined not to go to prison ordered his henchmen to him then themselves before the police could enter the apartment. As Adolfo was dead when they arrived, he was never charged, but 14 of the high-ranking cult members were convicted of a range of crimes, most serving upwards of 30 years in prison. Coming in at number 4 is Gary Ridgway. Gary grew up in a troubled household with very little stability, which led him to wetting his bed well into his teen years. After each incident, his mother would clean him up, which led Gary to have very conflicting feelings of both anger and desire towards his mother, often fantasizing about her and then doing unspeakable things to her corpse. When he got older, he joined the military, and although he was married, it was during this time in combat that he started to become obsessed with escorts. Once he returned back to America, his first marriage ended quite quickly after his wife discovered he had given her multiple infections. Soon after he married again, this time finding salvation in the church. He forced his wife into a staunch and devout life, but in contrast, kept his ravenous appetite for inappropriate relations both with his wife and with those whose company he paid for. But Ridgway had an inner conflict about his desires and started strangling the women after he had got what he wanted from them, dumping their brutalized bodies into the woods. Disgustingly, it was later revealed by one of his wives that he would often ask to have relations in the woods at the time. She didn't know why, but during investigations, multiple of his victims were found buried in those woods and authorities believe he got pleasure from being in the area. Upon his arrest, he was officially convicted for taking 49 lives, but during trial, he famously said that he had so many that he'd lost count and that even he didn't know the real number anymore. Thankfully, the monster was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility for parole, where he remains to this day. Coming in at number three is Richard Trenton Chase. Often referred to as the Vampire of Sacramento, Chase was a truly terrifying who took the life of six people in just one month back in 1977. Before he turned to human victims, Chase would capture animals before bringing them back to his apartment to kill and disembowel. From there, he would eat them raw, sometimes mixing them with Coca-Cola in his blender. Then, between 1973 to 76, Chase was forcibly admitted to an institution after being taken to an emergency room for trying to inject rabbit's blood into his veins. While in the facility, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and became known as the vampire as he all too often animals and drank their blood. But by 1976, he was deemed no longer a threat to society and released back into his mother's custody. Tragically, she began weaning him off his medication, believing that he didn't really need it. And once again, he slipped into evil habits. But this time, it wasn't birds and rabbits Chase was harming, it was breaking into homes and 
people before treating them just as he did his animals. Eventually, he was put on trial for his six victims, and a jury ruled him guilty, rejecting the defense's attempt that he could not be tried due to insanity. Chase was sentenced to death, but ended up taking his own life while behind bars before his execution. Coming in at number two is Ed Gein. Also known as the Butcher of Plainfield, this monster was a and body snatcher between 1947 to 1957. Gain grew up very religious. His mother was a devout Lutheran who taught her sons that women were inherently promiscuous and instruments of the devil. Gain became very attached to his mother, a little too much, and after his father and brother both died, she was all he had left. Gain became his mother's primary caregiver after she had a stroke, and then when she died in 1945, something snapped. And he became a different person. He began to visit graveyards at night, digging up middle-aged women that had similarities to his deceased mother. He'd then bring the bodies home before mutilating them, using their skin to make covers for his furniture, masks out of their faces, or using the bones for decoration and dishes. Even creepier was when he began creating an entire woman suit from various different exhumed bodies as he wanted to be able to become his mother and literally be in her skin. After exhuming dead bodies began to feel dull, he started to kill the victims himself. Two women lost their lives in his hands, both of which were found scattered across his property as furniture pieces, almost as if they were some prized hunting trophy. After his horror house was found by authorities in 1957, he was deemed legally insane and unfit for trial. He spent the rest of his life in an institution for the criminally insane until his death in 1984. And last up today, we have Jim Jones. If you've ever heard of the term drinking the Kool-Aid, this man is why. Growing up, Jones's family life was difficult. His father was a disabled war vet, frequently in and out of hospital, and his mother was was all around just neglectful. So Jones was pretty much left to his own devices. Looking for a family, he began to develop a community at his local church, but sadly it turned into a much darker obsession. Soon he began to study and idealize fascists and communist leaders and dreamed of becoming a preacher just like them. As an adult, he worked as a minister and began claiming to have psychic powers as well as an ability to heal the wounded and sick until eventually he started his own religion, the People's Temple. Sadly, he became drunk on power, and next thing you know, he was calling himself a prophet and began hoarding the cult members' money for his own gain. By 1977, he immigrated the community to Guyana to live as a commune called Jonestown. But after Congressman Ryan got hint of what was really going on down there, he went to investigate allegations of human rights abuse. The congressman ended up taking members from the cult who expressed their desire to leave. But Jones did not take kindly to this and ordered his henchmen to Ryan and his party. But after he got word that not everyone was taken out, he became afraid that the military would come down and shut down his entire operation. So he ordered that all members take their own lives as an act of revolution. Tragically, all 909 members, many of which were minors, were forced to take their own life with a mix of flavor aid and cyanide. All those that didn't go down willingly were given an injection. Prior to September of 2001, it was the greatest deliberate loss of American civilian life. Number 10, Tylenol Poisoning. On September 29th, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area ingested poison Tylenol pills, consequently collapsing and dying shortly after. Bottles of the popular pain and fever reliever were spiked with cyanide and returned to store shelves, targeting random people. After all the victims were buried on October 1st, 1982, it was revealed the Tylenol bottles were intentionally poisoned with potassium cyanide. Immediately, over 31 million bottles of Tylenol were recalled by the manufacturer and were issued warnings. They also offered to replace recalled bottles with new bottles and offered a $100,000 reward to anyone who may have any information on the perpetrator. Over $100 million, and there were several more copycat deaths across the United States after the initial incident had occurred. This led to the invention of safety seals that you see on medicine bottles today. To this day, no suspect has ever been charged or convicted of the poisonings. Number 9. Jailbreak at Alcatraz Penitentiary The famous island prison, a little over a mile off the coast of San Francisco, shut down in 1963 due to cost concerns. Today is a part of the National Park Service. 
Paris. For 30 years, it held prisoners, including gangsters Al Capone and George Machine Gun Kelly. Among its other famous inmates were brothers John and Clarence Algin and Frank Morris, who in 1962 executed an elaborate escape plan using three paper mache heads that made them appear to be sleeping as they crawled through ventilation ducts. One possible scenario is that the men drowned and their bodies were swept to sea, but the US Marshal Service has kept the case open in the unlikely event the trio is still alive, according to the FBI. So did they really escape? No one knows except for them. Number 8. Robbery Gone Wrong Sukju Ru immigrated from South Korea to Canada in 1972 and opened a new convenience store on the ground floor of a senior's home in the north end of Toronto. Sometime during the afternoon of February 18, 1993, Ru closed the store briefly to drive his wife home as he often did. Shortly after he returned, two teen boys reportedly entered the store with a firearm. Ru's daughter and police suspect he refused when the teens demanded he hand over his cash. Whatever happened, one of them shot him in the chest and they fled. A few minutes later, a customer found Rue laying on the floor and called 911. The suspects were last seen boarding a westbound bus, but by the time police caught up to the vehicle, the teens were gone. Police canvassed the neighborhood, collected evidence from the store, and brought the bus in for forensic examination. But with no solid leads or security footage, and with DNA technology still in its infancy, they couldn't zero in on the killers. In 2021, nearly 30 years after Rue's death, Toronto police reopened the case in the hopes of extracting DNA and further evidence from what was collected on scene, hoping that advancements in testing technology might crack the case. Number 7. Wall Street of 1920. During the lunch rush on Wall Street on a September day in 1920, a man driving a cart pressed an old horse forward in front of the USSA office across from the JP Morgan building. He stopped his cart, got down, and immediately disappeared into the crowd. Minutes later, the cart exploded into a hail of metal fragments, resulting in the deaths of more than 30 people and injuring 300. The aftermath was horrific, and the death toll rose as the day wore on and more victims succumbed to their injuries. The end NYPD was able to reconstruct the bomb and its fuse mechanism, but there was much debate about the nature of the explosive. However, the most promising lead had actually come prior to the explosion. A mailman had found a crudely spelled and printed flyers in the Wall Street area from a group calling itself the American Anarchist Fighters that demanded the release of political prisoners. The letter seemed similar to the ones used the previous year in two bombing campaigns which were led by Italian anarchists. The Bureau investigated up and down the East Coast to trace the printing of these flyers, but they were unsuccessful. In the end, the bombers were not identified. Number 6. Death of Eliza Lamb On January 26, 2013, 21-year-old Canadian tourist Eliza Lamb checked into the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. When she never checked out on February 1st, nor had any contact with her parents, the Los Angeles Police Department was contacted. On February 19th, 18 days from the last time she was seen, Eliza's body was found floating and naked in a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel. Her body was found due to hotel guests complaining about the hotel's water pressure. One couple even reported that the water was coming out black and had a bad taste, which just like, ew, ew, ew. According to the hotel's manager, when she first checked in, she was staying in a hostel style room with other travelers, but was later moved to to her own private room due to complaints from her roommates about odd behavior. The last time she was seen was on surveillance footage on the hotel's elevator. The footage showed Eliza acting strange, almost like she was hiding. She also moved her hands in strange ways and looked like she was talking to someone who was out of the security camera's view. After her body and the surveillance footage were found, it was suggested that she was on some sort of hallucinogenic drug. But even though she took four different medications for her bipolar disorder, toxicology studies reported that there were no traces of any drugs or alcohol that could have contributed to her death. To this day, no one knows how she was able to access the roof or climb into the water tank and shut the 20 pound lid by herself. Number 5. The Hall Mills Murders In 1922 in New Brunswick, New Jersey, Minister Edward Wheeler Hall was having an extramarital affair with a member of his congregation that also married Eleanor Mills. On September 14th, the two left their respective family homes to meet each other. When the minister didn't return home that night, his wife and one of his brother-in-laws began a search. Edward and Eleanor were found two days later when another couple walking Lover's Lane found their bodies. Edward had been shot once through the head, but Eleanor had been shot in the face three times and her throat had been slashed.
slashed so deeply that she had nearly been decapitated. Later, an autopsy revealed that her tongue and larynx had been cut out. The case was clearly personal. Though their affair had apparently been common knowledge around the town, both of their spouses claimed to have been in the dark, which was found as highly suspicious. Then, witness statements kept changing, attention seekers kept confessing to the deaths, and physical evidence was destroyed when sightseers trampled the crime scene looking for souvenirs. As a result, Edward and Eleanor's deaths were never solved. Number 4. Lizzie Borden Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That famous rhyme makes it seem as if there's never been any doubt as to whether Lizzie Borden ended the lives of her father and stepmother on, on August 4th, 1892. Officially though, the identity of the killer remains a mystery. Lizzie and a maid, Bridget Sullivan, were alone in the Borden house with Mr. and Mrs. Borden when Lizzie discovered her father dead. He had been repeatedly struck in the head with a blunt instrument. Upstairs, she found the body of her stepmother. Now, initially, the evidence against Lizzie looked damning. She had recently attempted to purchase prussic acid, a poison, and was alleged to have burned a dress in the stove. And the maid, Bridget, her suspected accomplice, was seen out the evening of August 4th carrying a parcel out of the house. But at Lizzie's trial in 1893, the court determined that all evidence was merely circumstantial. Lizzie wasn't convicted, and no other suspects were ever arrested. Number 3. Dan Cooper one of the most famous heists in history occurred on November 24th, 1971, when a man who identified himself as Dan Cooper bought a one-way ticket to Seattle on Northwest Orient Airlines from Portland, Oregon. After the plane was airborne, Dan handed the flight attendant a note. At first, she just put it in her pocket without looking, but then Cooper told her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. He opened a briefcase to reveal red color sticks surrounded by an array of wires. He told the flight attendant to write down everything he was saying and take it to the captain. The note said, I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash, exclusively in $20 bills. Put it in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. FBI agents assembled the ransom money and Seattle police obtained the parachutes from a local skydiving school. When Dan claimed his demands were met, he allowed all the passengers and some of the crew to exit the airplane. He told the remaining crew to refuel fuel the plane and chart a course for Mexico City while staying below 10,000 feet. Then somewhere between Seattle and Reno, he jumped from the plane with the money and he was never seen again. Despite an expansive manhunt and over 45 years of searching, no conclusions have been made as to the man's identity or his fate after he jumped. It is called one of the greatest cold cases in FBI and US history. Number 2. Death of the Black Dahlia On January 15, 1947, 22-year-old Elizabeth Short was found dead in residential Los Angeles. Her body was so mutilated as the body was cut in half and so pale and drained of blood that the woman who discovered it thought she had stumbled upon a mannequin. The body was cut with surgical precision, leaving no trauma to internal organs and bones. Her face was also cut from mouth to ears, leaving an eerie permanent smile. There was no blood on the ground, making it believe that the body was moved after she had been killed. Nine days after she was discovered, an envelope was sent to the examiner that read, the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers. Here is Dahlia's belongings. Letter to follow. As promised, the envelope contained her social security card, birth certificate, photographs, names written on pieces of papers, and an address book. Then on March 14th, a note was found tucked in a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue in Venice. The note read, to whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. Although many suspects were named, no authorities were able to identify who ended the Black Dahlia's life. And coming in at number one is Brian Carr death. On the evening of November 10th, 1988, Brian Carr and some friends went bar hopping. As he was driving home alone in the early morning, he reportedly stopped next to a young man riding a bicycle in the road. The two spoke for a while, and then Brian drove off. That was the last time anyone saw him alive. When he failed to show up to a family function the next day, his relatives visited his house to find his door ajar and his lifeless body on the floor in his bedroom, strangled and stabbed. His wallet had been stolen, and on his wall, someone had written in pen, I will kill again. Based on the scene of the crime, police suspected that Brian had been killed following a consensual same 
same-sex encounter. Some believe the nature of the death hindered the case. Charlottetown's gay community accused the police of treating his death with indifference. For nearly three decades, the investigation went nowhere, but in 2018, an anonymous informant called the police from a payphone, suggesting they had a tip to deliver about Brian's death. The source hung up before divulging into any info, though, and the police later put out a call encouraging him to come forward again to share what he knows. Starting off at number 10 now, we have Watergate. Absolute classic. On June 17th, 1972, several burglars were arrested in the office at the Democratic National Committee located in the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. So what, you may ask? Well, it wasn't any normal robbery. The men were connected to President Nixon's re-election campaign, and they had been caught red-handed wiretapping phones and stealing documents from the opposition. Though that was only half of the scandal, though. When the rumors started circulating, Nixon actively tried to cover his tracks and any trails that would lead back to him. Over the next two years, Nixon would go about firing anyone within the White House administration that he wanted to create distance between because of the ongoing FBI investigation. By 1974, the investigation began moving to impeach Nixon himself. They eventually found a secret recording from just after the burglary happened that seemed to show Nixon had been lying when he said he was not involved in the cover-up. He resigned from office, becoming the only US president to ever do so. Moving on to number nine now, we have Operation Northwoods. In 1962, the US Department of Defense proposed a plan to President Kennedy. They needed justification for going to war with Cuba and deposing the newly elected Fidel Castro, who had just become a bastion of communism, just a stone's throw away from Florida. The plan they had was for the US government operatives to commit acts of terrorism against American civilians and military targets, blame it on the Cuban government, and then declare war on Cuba. That was the plan they proposed, to kill their own civilians and blame it on others so they could just start a war. Thankfully, JFK said no. Hopefully, because it's clearly a mental plan. Not only that, he removed the chairman from his job after that proposal. It would be another 35 years before the plan was declassified and the world could learn just how mental it was. Next up at number eight now, we have Operation Paperclip. What if I told you that after World War II, the US government smuggled in more than 1,600 German scientists into the US as the Third Reich collapsed. Many of them were former members of the Nazi party. Some were even former leaders. Why would the US do this? Well, with the Second World War over, the Cold War was now beginning, with the US and Russia vying for technological superiority. They believed that these scientists would help give the US a military advantage and also help them with the space race. You can see, though, how this wouldn't have played very well with the American public. Nazi scientists living in America while families are picking themselves up after a horrific war. It was President Truman who originally signed off on this order. Years later, in 1963, Truman recalled that he was not reluctant to approve of Operation Paperclip because of the US relationship with Russia at the time, saying this had to be done and was done. Next up at number seven now, we have the JFK assassination. As soon as I say that, some people are thinking, oh God, I really hope Danny isn't one of those crazy conspiracy nuts. No, no I'm not. I don't really have any strongly held beliefs about the assassination of President Kennedy. Some people still say he was killed by a rogue Secret Service agent or that there were multiple gunmen. Take a look at the evidence yourself and make up your own mind. One thing I do find interesting though is the government's continued withholding of information. Every document relating to the investigation into the assassination was supposed to be automatically released in 2017. The world was finally going to learn what happened and if there ever was any attempt at a cover-up. But then President Trump had a last-minute change of heart. He blocked the release of some documents and redacted others, citing national security concerns. He then went on to state that some of the documents must continue to be withheld in the interest of national security that outweighs the public interest. Just like everything else involved with the JFK assassination, there may be a perfectly reasonable explanation for everything, but all of this withholding and redacting has only given fuel to the fire of conspiracy theorists. Moving on to number six now, we have surveillance. For a while, it was a running joke that the CIA was listening in on the American people. But in 2013, the joke really turned into a reality. Edward Snowden, a former employee of the CIA, became the whistleblower for a huge cover-up. He told the media how the American government was spying on its citizens by collecting the telephone records of tens of millions of people. Not long after that, things took an even bigger turn when it was announced the NSA had access to the servers of Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and a number of others. The surveillance program came under a wider operation called PRISM.
Prism that monitored 600 million communications a day, sometimes even outside of the US. The years that followed sparked large scale debates and investigations into the powers of the surveillance operations. Coming in at number 5 now, we have Operation Majestic 12. According to some conspiracy theorists, this was the code name given to a top secret committee of 12 scientists, military officials, and government officials formed by President Truman in 1947. Their goal was simple to recover and investigate alien spacecraft. The theory started when UFOlogist Jamie Shandira received an envelope containing film which showed images of eight pages of documents that appeared to be briefing papers describing the Majestic 12. It also acknowledged the alien spacecraft at Roswell in 1947 that had been concealed and that officials believed recovered alien technology could be exploited. It even contained plans for how to engage with extraterrestrial life in the future. The government has always denied all of this and to be honest, even a lot of UFOlogists have too. There are now only a very small amount of people who give any credence to the Majestic 12 theory as being real, but they believe it's the biggest cover up of all time. Moving on to number 4 now, we have Project MK Ultra. To put it quite simply, this was a 20 year program of experiments conducted by the CIA on members of the American public. They tested drugs and procedures on people to see if they could enhance interrogation techniques and force confessions through mind control. Many of the drugs were psychedelic in nature, LSD was used extensively. At some points these experiments were even designed to see if they could make people do things against their own will, even if it went against their own self preservation. The experiments began in 1953 across America and Canada, they were reduced in 1964, then in 1967 and finally stopped altogether in 1973. All of this is only known though when it was first brought to the public's attention in 1975, after 20 years. It was difficult for investigators to understand the full scope of these experiments because the former CIA director Richard Helms had ordered that most of the MK Ultra records be destroyed. Next up number 3 now we have Area 51. You guys may have heard of this US Air Force base in the Nevada desert. For decades now it has been the mecca for all things conspiracy and alien related. The fact that this base has always been so secretive has only served to stoke the fire. Some people believe that the US government keeps captured aliens there. One famous example is the 1947 Roswell crash site which many people say was actually the site where an alien ship crashed. Since then they think the government has been reverse engineering alien technology without the public knowing. There are other less known theories such as the belief that the US government filmed the 1969 moon landings in one of the base hangars. Whether or not you believe in all of the conspiracy theories, the US government is hiding some things from the public there. In its 65 year history, the government didn't even acknowledge the base existed until 2005 when they were forced to due to a freedom of information request. Most experts presume the base is used for top secret experimental aircraft and weapon systems testing. Despite the slightly increased openness when it comes to Area 51, most people won't feel truly happy until every inch of it is made known to the public. Moving on to number 2 now guys, we have Project Sunshine. This was a series of studies commissioned by the US Atomic Energy Commission. Now they wanted to examine the long term effects of nuclear radiation on human life due to nuclear testing. They were particularly interested in analyzing the tissue of young people who have the highest susceptibility to radiation damage. One of the lead members of the project, Dr. Willard Libby said there was insufficient data regarding the effects of nuclear fallout due to lack of human samples. He was quoted as saying, and this quote is absolutely crazy, I don't know how to get them but I do say that it is a matter of prime importance to get them and particularly in the young age group. So human samples are often of prime importance and if anybody knows how to do a good job of body snatching they will really be serving their country. Mental. In the end they gathered over 1500 bodies, many of whom were young children from Australia and Europe without their parents consent or knowledge. In 1959 the project was finally brought to a halt. And finally now at number 1 we have Lennon listeners. This may not be the most serious thing on this list but the US government spied on John Lennon as in one of the Beatles. It's a very bizarre story. In the early 70s Lennon was getting a lot of attention for saying some pretty controversial things he said 
that war is bad and peace is good. Naturally, this was against the government's line at the time, who were busy trying to convince the American public that the ongoing war in Vietnam was a good thing. Lenin ended up on an FBI watch list, they terminated his visa and began deportation proceedings. They even followed the activities of Yoko Ono, his wife. In the end, through all of this following and spying, they discovered something shocking. John Lennon was just a huge music icon who didn't like war. Yeah, they found nothing. No conspiracies, no plots, he was just a normal dude. The FBI closed its investigation a month after Nixon was re-elected. The events are detailed in the 2006 documentary, The US vs. John Lennon. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Gulf of Tonkin. Thanks to a document from the National Security Agency that was declassified, many people received a confirmation of what they long believed. This is the idea that one of the two supposed North Vietnamese attacks on US ships in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964, the attack that the president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, and his administration used to justify the massive escalation of the Vietnam War, yeah, apparently it didn't happen at all. The historical analysis conducted and declassified by the NSA revealed this all. In the article, it is noted that intelligence and defense officials who knew about the faked attack, or rather who doubted the evidence brought forward by the administration, didn't speak up because of a quote, awareness that President Johnson was would brook no uncertainty that could undermine his position. It's a terrifying reality, especially when we look at the war and what went on to happen from there. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Teapot Dome scandal. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior to former President Warren G. Harding, and while in this position, he decided to secretly allow oil companies to tap into the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve in Wyoming and the Elk Hills Oil Reserve in California. Of course, the reason he did this is because he could make a ton of extra money doing this, like several hundred thousand dollars. This all started to unravel though in 1922 when there was an expose that revealed that the oil had been sold without any sort of competitive bidding. After this expose, Robert La Follette, who was a senator from Wisconsin, created an investigation into the story by the Senate Committee on Public Lands. The Attorney General at the time, Harry Dougherty, began to get some flack for not investigating this alleged corruption, so Harry turned to the FBI director to help him out. The FBI director, William J. Burns, sent an agent to Robert, the senator from Wisconsin's office, to search for anything that could be used to blackmail him into stopping the investigation into the corruption. Despite this very obvious threat, Robert knew that this meant that his investigation was going to reveal something serious, which motivated him to continue on with it. In the end, the shady dealings and bribery was all revealed and Albert Fall was officially exposed. This entire ordeal led to him being the first United States cabinet secretary to go to prison. In our number 8 spot today, we have the health risk denial. In this day and age, everyone knows that smoking cigarettes isn't great for your health, but back in the day, people did know and the tobacco industry did everything they could to make sure that they never found out. In 1950, a physician and epidemiologist named Dr. Ernst Widener published a study in the Journal of American Medical Association that pointed out the links between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. This is something that is is well known and studied now, but at this time, this was news to much of the public and to hide it, six major cigarette companies began to fund their own research efforts in response to the study. This wasn't a study aimed at actually getting to the bottom of the health risks, it was just a research project meant for publicity reasons. In reality, they already knew about the health hazards and that there was a possible link to cancer. In a 1953 survey of scientific literature, a man named Cloud to Tige, Tog, Teague? <laughs> A man named Claude Tige, who was a chemist for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, concluded that, quote, studies of clinical data tend to confirm a link between the heavy use of cigarettes and lung cancer. A scientist for a major tobacco company at the time knew and had studied the links, and still they were trying to cloud the public perception of this huge issue. The entire strategy was later revealed in a 1972 industry memo, which described it as, quote, creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it. Finally, this madness was brought to an end, sort of, when the attorney generals from 46 states joined together in one massive lawsuit against the tobacco industry. As a result of this, while they can continue to make their harmful product, in 1998, the companies agreed to pay $10 billion annually to make up for the damage that they had done. Doesn't really make up for it, but whatever. In our number seven spot today, we have the Great Mississippi Flood. The Mississippi Flood of 1927 stands as one of the most devastating natural disasters 
disasters of the century. Countless homes were destroyed, displacing a significant number of individuals in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. In response to this catastrophic event, then Secretary of Commerce Hebert Hoover, in collaboration with the Red Cross, initiated fundraising efforts to restore the over 23,000 square miles of flood damaged land. This endeavor not only aimed to address the immense devastation, but also sought to enhance Hoover's public image. Given his previous commendable efforts in providing food to war refugees after World War I, the flood presented an opportunity for him to demonstrate his capabilities once again. Consequently, a substantial media campaign was launched highlighting Hoover's purported dedication to aiding all those affected by the disaster. The Red Cross, reliant on public donations, shared a vested interest in projecting a positive image as well. This led to the suppression of the troubling realities surrounding the relief efforts. Tragically, it was revealed that at many of the camps established for flood victims, predominantly black Americans were held against their will and subjected to forced labor on the levees. These black refugees faced threats of violence should they refuse to comply, inadequate food provisions, and lack of adequate shelter. This egregious violation of human rights went largely unnoticed, overshadowed by the grand humanitarian campaign. Although some individuals attempted to expose the truth, the overwhelming volume of the relief's efforts' positive narrative drowned out their voices. Sadly, it was only later that this entire ordeal came to light, although not soon enough as Hoover went on to win the presidency a year later. For a more detailed examination of this deeply unjust cover-up and its impact on race relations at the time, there's a very compelling paper titled The Red Cross is Not Alright by Miles McMurtry, and I would highly recommend it. It provides an exceptionally well-written and comprehensive account of the events and their repercussions. In our number six spot today, we have the Pentagon Papers. In June of 1971, the New York Times published a few different excerpts that were taken from a top secret Department of Defense report that pertained to the United States and their involvement in the Vietnam War from 1945 to 1967. These papers were created as part of a study by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and the reason they were so important and secret is because they revealed that four consecutive presidential administrations had lied to and misled both Congress as well as the American people about the involvement in the war. Daniel Ellsberg, who was said to have been a military analyst who opposed the war, leaked these confidential government records, and him, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post, all faced criminal charges in court for their efforts to get the paper into public knowledge, but in a turn of events, the charges were later dismissed. Not only were these papers important, but the leak was a crucial moment in time because it bred major, major distrust in the United States government that would go on to only grow. In our number five spot today, we have PRISM. This is one of the leaks that was made by Edward Snowden, and it involves a PowerPoint presentation. Remember those relics? This wasn't just any old PowerPoint, though. It was a presentation that involved the NSA. The slideshow was one that was used to help train intelligence personnel, and it detailed the United States and their involvement in a secret program called PRISM. This program was the NSA's effort to collect a ton of data from internet companies. The data ranged from email content to search histories to file transfers. The reason this PowerPoint was so important is because it confirmed that the NSA had access to the servers of major US internet service providers like YouTube, Google, Skype, and Apple. PRISM first began in 2007 with Microsoft and expanded to Apple in 2012. When leaked, Snowden warned that the extent of this data collection was a lot greater than the public even knew, and that it included what he called dangerous and criminal activities. In our number four spot today, we have Operation Mincemeat. This one is different from most of the others on this list today, and that is because it was a planned lie that proved that not all lies are harmful. This lie came from the Allied forces during World War II, or really the operation itself was basically to plant this fake, top secret information on a body that had washed up on a beach on the coast of Spain. Basically, this information was intended to lead what we'll call, for the sake of the online guidelines, the Yahtzees, into thinking that the Allies were going to invade Greece and Sardinia when the real plan was to invade Italy. British intelligence officers knew they had work to do, and it involved inventing an entire fictional life for the body that was being planted on the beach. There was fake correspondence, and they even went as far as to have a photograph with a fake fiancé. When many people's lives are at risk, cutting corners is not the right idea. In the end, the plan fooled both Spanish authorities as well as German leaders in 1943, who sent all of their troops to Greece. While they did this, the Allied forces invaded Sicily. As the Axis powers began to 
lose in the Battle of Sicily, the Italian dictator Mussolini was dismissed as the prime minister and subsequently imprisoned. This remains one of the most interesting information leaks in history. In our number three spot today, we have Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods was a proposed covert operation developed within the U.S. Department of Defense dur during the early 1960s. The plan outlined a series of false flag operations that would create a pretext for military intervention and generate public support for a war against Cuba. The operation's primary objective was to manipulate public opinion and garner domestic and international backing for a U.S. military invasion of Cuba. The proposed actions in Operation Northwoods were shocking and included acts of serious, large-scale violence. The plans ranged from stage hijackings of planes to orchestrating attacks on U.S. military and civilian targets. These acts were intended to be attributed to Cuba, thus justifying military retaliation against the island nation. Fortunately, Operation Northwoods was never implemented. The plan was presented to President John F. Kennedy's administration, but was ultimately rejected. The ethical concerns and potential consequences associated with such deceptive and aggressive tactics were deemed incompatible with American values and principles. The existence of Operation Northwoods came to public knowledge in 1997 when declassified documents were released. The revelations sparked widespread discussion and criticism of government actions and the potential for false flag operations throughout history. While Operation Northwoods remains a chilling reminder of the length some may consider going to manipulate public sentiment and justify military actions, its exposure serves as a reminder of the importance of transparency, ethical decision making, and the critical examination of government actions. In our number two spot today, we have the Roswell UFO incident. The Roswell UFO incident is one of the most famous and controversial events in UFO lore. In July 1947, an unidentified object crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. The initial press release by the U.S. Army stated that it was a, quote, flying disc that had been recovered, capturing the public's attention. However, the following day, the official statement was revised, claiming it was actually a weather balloon. The contrasting information surrounding the Roswell incident has fueled numerous conspiracy theories. One prevailing theory suggests that the government covered up the true nature of the crash and that it was, in fact, an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Believers argue that alien bodies were recovered from the crash site and that the government initiated a massive cover-up to conceal evidence of extraterrestrial life. Skeptics, on the other hand, contend that the crash was simply the result of a top-secret military project such as the Mogul Balloon, which involved high-altitude monitoring of Soviet nuclear tests. Over the years, numerous witnesses have come forward with varying testimonies, adding to the complexity of the Roswell incident. Some claim to have seen debris with unusual properties or encountered military personnel involved in the recovery. However, the reliability of these accounts is subject of ongoing debate. The Roswell incident continues to captivate the public's imagination, and the contrasting information and conspiracies surrounding it have made it a focal point for UFO enthusiasts and skeptics alike. In our number one spot today, we have the Watergate scandal. The Watergate scandal of the 1970s remains one of the most infamous political scandals in American history. It began with the break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. on June 17, 1972. The subsequent investigation exposed a web of illegal activities and cover-ups involving high-level officials within the Nixon administration. Initially viewed as a small-scale burglary, the scope of the scandal quickly expanded as evidence linking the break-in to President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign known as the Committee to Re-elect the President. Investigations by journalists and a Senate committee revealed a systematic abuse of power, including political espionage, campaign finance violations, and attempts to obstruct justice. The pivotal moment came with the discovery of secret White House tape recordings that exposed Nixon's direct involvement in the cover-up. The tapes revealed conversations implicating the president in efforts to obstruct the FBI's investigation into the break-in and to use government agencies to punish political opponents. Facing impeachment, Nixon resigned on August 8, 1974, becoming the only U.S. president to do so. The Watergate scandal profoundly shook public trust in the government and led to reforms in campaign finance laws, ethics regulations, and government transparency. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have democracy. Apparently, it is common for people to believe that America introduced democracy to the world, but that is just very untrue. It is true, however, that America was extremely influential in the rise of democracy. America was certainly a leader when it came to making the move from the monarchy that had been ruling in Europe for centuries to a democratic society, but America absolutely did not invent democracy. In around 500 
107 BC, the Greeks actually had their own form of democracy, which was called Democratia. This was a direct rule by the people rather than the representative democracy we have now, and it even included three separate branches of government. Democratia did of course have its caveats though, considering women, foreigners, and the slaves were excluded, and around 85% of the population had no political rights. In our number nine spot today, we have the light bulb. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far, because it really helps us out. In school, we usually learn that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, but that is another one of those things that is just not true. Well, it's kind of true, but it leaves out a ton of other vital information. It actually took a whole team of people, like many great scientific advancements do. While the light bulb that Edison made was patented in 1879, the invention of it starts all the way back in 1800 with Italian inventor Alessandro Volta, who was responsible for the first practical method of generating electricity, which was called the Voltic Pile. After this, there was the English chemist Humphrey Davy, who created the first electric lamp by connecting those piles to charcoal electrodes. After this, there were two more scientists, Warren De La Rue and William Strait, who independently improved upon the designs to make them more efficient. This obviously still isn't the end, you guys. After this, Joseph Swan made the design more cost efficient, which would help it be more widely accessible. And then after this, Edison was able to improve the design further. But then even after that, Louis Latimer was the one who improved the design to the point where the widespread use of electricity was a popularity. This was an extremely long winded way of saying there's a lot of people who had a hand in this. And if we're going to learn about one, we should probably learn about all of them. In our number eight spot today, we have the round earth. If there are any flat earthers out there watching this video, you might want to skip over this one. There's a common belief that Christopher Columbus was the one who proved that the earth is round, but that is simply just untrue. It is highly likely that he never thought that the earth was flat at all. We've known the world was round long before the days of Christopher Columbus. So far back that the first written document we have noting the knowledge of the world being round dates back to the fifth century as it was written by Greek philosophers. This knowledge goes back even further though as it actually stems from the 3rd century BC as astronomers even calculated the Earth's circumference back then. So I think it's safe to say that Christopher Columbus is certainly not responsible for this discovery. In our number 7 spot today we have the discovery of America. While we're on the topic of things Christopher Columbus didn't discover, let's talk about America. It has been widely believed for a long time that Christopher Columbus discovered America, but that is very obviously not true at all. First of all, let's start off with the simple fact that there were already people living there. How could you discover something that's already been found? Secondly, the first European to find North America is believed to be Leif Erikson, and this happened 500 years before Columbus. And lastly, Columbus didn't even make it to North America at all. He set out on a voyage to the Western Hemisphere and landed in the Caribbean Islands and Central and South America. In our number six spot today, we have where slavery existed. Apparently it is believed by some people that America only had slavery in the South, but that is extremely untrue. While the Southern states certainly had some of the largest populations of slaves and also saw most of the revolts, slavery existed in all parts of the US. Massachusetts was actually the first known colony to legalize slavery. While it was beginning to gradually end in the Northern states, New York passed a gradual emancipation law in 1799, which basically just kept younger slaves under ownership until they reached adulthood. And all the way in 1830, there were still 75 slaves living in New York, and it was still another full decade after that until the last slave was finally freed. So yeah, slavery was certainly not a thing that was only seen in the South. In our number five spot today, we have the witch trials. Most of us have heard of the Salem witch trials, but if you haven't, they were the trials and prosecution of people who were accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts from 1692 to 1693. These trials were particularly gruesome as there were 200 people accused and 30 of them, mainly women, were found guilty. Five of those 30 were jailed and the rest were very sadly executed. 
This is the deadliest witch hunt ever in North America, and it is certainly one of America's most well-known cases of mass hysteria, as all of these accusations were of course false. There's a weird theory that has become pretty common that originated in 1976. This theory is that rye ergot, which is a fungus that can cause hallucinations, was in the bread that was being produced by the people who lived in Salem. So this would lead the theory to speculate that ergot poisoning is what caused these trials as people were hallucinating hallucinating these supernatural events. Well, many historians and medical professionals have claimed that this theory is very inaccurate. This theory is simply just speculation and is truly based in no evidence at all. These trials, however, were a clear sign of the dangers of isolationism, religious extremism, false accusations, and lapses in due process. In our number four spot today, we have the Model T. The Model T is a legendary car that put Henry Ford on the map, considering he is the incredible inventor. And while some people believe that Henry is the inventor of the automobile, that isn't exactly true. Steam-powered vehicles have roots all the way back in 1769, but it wasn't until the 19th century that we would see gasoline-powered automobiles. In 1887, Carl Benz, who was a German engineer, was responsible for this invention, and this is when production vehicles began appearing. The Model T was created in 1908, and this is when it became the first automobile to become mass-produced on an assembly line. So the Model T certainly shaped the automobile industry, but it was by no means the first automobile. In our number three spot today, we have the stock market crash. The stock market crash of 1929 is still remembered as one of the worst economic events in our history. It was an undoubtedly horrible time that caused a lot of financial damage for years to come. There's a very dark myth surrounding this economic crash, however, but today we will talk about the truth. This myth is that the crash was so terrible, there was an unparalleled amount of people taking their own lives by jumping from high-rise buildings. This myth is believed to have stemmed from Winston Churchill as he recounted someone jumping from the 16th floor of a hotel on the morning of Black Thursday. But this incident happened hours before the crash, so there's certainly no proof that these two events were correlated. This was then exacerbated after a newspaper columnist, Will Rogers, wrote that men were jumping to their demise so quickly that you had to stand in line to get a window to jump out of. Well, this certainly isn't true as there were only two records of people taking their own lives that day, although that is certainly too, too many. It's not exactly the picture it was painted out to be. It is thought that 100 people took their lives that year, and in the following years, the rate continued to rise. As it turns out, 1932 was a much more deadly year in that category than 1929 was. In our number two spot today, we have Thanksgiving. So everything we're taught about Thanksgiving is a lie. Well, that is if you were taught that we celebrate it because the story originates from a big feast that European settlers had with indigenous Americans. That didn't really happen that way at all. This little feel-good story was created a little over a century ago, and while it was based in actual happenings, the truth is significantly more grim. There isn't necessarily an agreed-upon happening that began the Thanksgiving tradition, but there's a few historical events that are believed to possibly be the beginning. One happened in 1619 when settlers in Berkeley 100 in Virginia decided to celebrate their arrival annually. A more grim origin story comes from 1637 when there was a big celebratory feast that took place. This feast was put on by Massachusetts colony governor John Winthrop as he wanted to celebrate colonial soldiers who just returned from slaughtering hundreds of Pequot people. So yeah, it certainly isn't the holiday we all think of it as. In our number one spot today, we have the end of slavery. The 13th Amendment and the Civil War are sometimes regarded as the ending of slavery in America, but there is a pretty obvious loophole that we are all looking over. The 13th Amendment still allowed forced labor as a punishment for crime. Okay, not necessarily a fantastic rule, but then if you just stay out of trouble, it shouldn't be an issue, right? Well, obviously not right as thousands and thousands of black people living in America now found themselves being basically kidnapped off the streets and accused of committing crimes or accused of committing absurdly vague crimes such as vagrancy. They would then be issued fines that they would not be able to pay, which would end up with them getting sold to businesses to work in mines or timber yards or on farms or railroads. And these working conditions certainly were no better than the conditions of slavery. So while the 13th Amendment absolutely should have been the end of forced slavery in America, it absolutely was not. It was just hidden in a different package. <laughs> 